Servus. That's what you say, right? Yeah. Nein, hallo. Uh, so uh, my name is Raquel Velez. I'm Rockbot on the Twitters and the GitHubs and all the things. And uh, I work at NPM. I have worked at NPM for three years now. And I worked my way up from a, a wonderful little web engineer all the way up to now I'm the engineering manager of the services team. And the services team covers everything from the website to the registry to the enterprise product to operations, making sure that all the servers stay up and all that good stuff. And uh, so today what I want to talk about, because I started out as a web engineer and have been there for three years, I've seen the web site at NPM change quite a lot. And we've made a lot of decisions, we've made a ton of mistakes, we've learned a lot of things, and I, and I really wanted to kind of share all of those things with you. So before we get started on all of that, first I want to kind of find out how many of you use NPM? Okay, maybe it'd be easier. How many, who, who has never heard of NPM ever before? Okay, excellent. You're gonna learn something, that'll be great. Uh, <laughs> no, okay. Uh, somebody asked, can, can the others leave? No, no, stay. I need you, okay. Uh, so uh, let's, let's talk about NPM in general. So NPM is a package manager for JavaScript. And while a lot of people think that NPM stands for Node Package Manager, while it was created as a package manager for Node, N, P, and M are really just three letters and they just kind of just say NPM. It doesn't actually mean Node Package Manager. But even then, Node is still a package manager and it's, was, it's meant for JavaScript, but that's even a little bit misleading because people have been sneaking in other types of code into the registry over the last several years. So you can actually find some CSS in there, you can find some Go and you can find some Rust and somebody even snuck in some C++ and some Python. I don't know, whatever, it's just a Java, it's just a, it's just a package manager. Uh, but I like to think it's a pretty good one. And at NPM, our number one priority is to reduce friction, right? All we really wanna do is we wanna make sure that you are as successful as possible pushing your code out into production, right? NPM is a tool. Tools should never get in your way. If we're getting in your way, you're not getting to be awesome. So if you find that you are struggling with NPM or uh, there's something about NPM that's just driving you absolutely, just making you go wild, let us know. Send us a tweet, send us an email, send us, uh, put in issues into our GitHub trackers, let us know because we want to get out of your way so that you can just be amazing. Okay, so NPM. NPM started out as a completely 100% open source project. In 2009, Node became, came into the world as this whole silly idea of JavaScript on the server. Oh my goodness, what was that? Uh, and, and people were like, oh, that seems like an interesting idea. And there were a few people who came together and they were like, yeah, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's go ahead and let's make this whole server-side JavaScript thing a thing. And they started writing applications, and then they realized that a lot of, it, like, that they were writing the same functions over and over again because they needed it for their applications. They're like, you know, this is silly. Why are we writing the same functions by hand every single time? Wouldn't it be easier if we just wrote the function once, and then someone else could just, you know, use that function as needed? And thus, the Node, node Package Manager, not NPM, but you know, anyway, and <laughs> thus NPM was born. And, uh, and, and it was really interesting, right? Because people started getting into it. And even this like really silly idea of server-side JavaScript started to really take off. And by take off, I mean really take off. This is just the first three years of, 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 of JavaScript on the server, NPM and Node. Uh, these are people who are installing Node packages. They're installing packages from NPM and, and they're using them. And then, but in, t in addition to that, we're starting to see people are not only consuming these packages, but they're also publishing packages. They're contributing to the Node ecosystem with their own packages, and they're doing it at an exponential rate. And this was fascinating, right? Because here's this open source project that went completely Oh my goodness, what is going on? So, how many people used Node in 2013? Anybody? Okay, a few people. Do you remember the dark days? <laughs> and at the, end, at the end of 2013, uh, the servers kept going down. Uh, NPM servers kept going dark because 
turns out, when you have an open source project, all of the time that's put into it is volunteered, right? And all of the hardware that's used is, is donated. And, uh, and so we, unfortunately, nobody expected it to go quite as well as it did. And unfortunately, what happened is the servers got overloaded. And there was no guarantee that a volunteer was available to help try to fix things. And there was no guarantee that more people were going to donate hardware to help keep the registry alive. And so people were actually using Node in production. People were relying on NPM to install packages so that they could ship new stuff. And NPM wasn't reliable anymore. So Isaac Schluter, the creator of NPM, de decided to make NPM into a company in 2014. And the reason he made it into a company is because he realized, hey, wait a second, we have people who are volunteering their time and machines that are donated, we can't, this isn't sustainable. We need to actually start paying people to maintain these servers. We need to start paying for servers so that we can scale. And the only way to do that is, at least in a nice, uh, in a nice economic, sustainable system, you need like an ecosystem of money right? Because people need money to get paid and eat and all that good stuff. So in order to do that, we need to get our users to pay us money. And how do we do that? Well, we add value. So we create products and services on top of NPM so that people like you say, hey, wait a second, I want that product. I'm going to pay you some money for that. And we can go, yay! And then I can get paid. Good. <laughs> so let's talk specifically about the website. How many of you make, web make websites right now? Okay, good. So hopefully some of the things that we've experienced, uh, you can either uh, have that same experience or maybe you can learn from our mistakes and not ever make them ever. That'd be really great. Okay. So in the history of the website on NPM, at least in the last three years, we've seen a lot of user growth. I mean, any good graph goes up and to the right, which is exactly what this does. But what I really appreciate about this graph is you can also see the peaks, which are when we made positive changes to the website, and the valleys, which you might think, okay, well, correlatively, that must mean negative changes to the website, but you don't really make negative changes to the website, but actually, they're vacations, which I think is really interesting. Users go on vacation, and you see these really big kind of dips right around uh, the Christmas holiday, uh, and we call that at NPM the Christmas chasm when everybody finally just stops working for a little while and does something else. Um, and I think that's really cool. But today what I want to cover is I'm going to, I've split up the website. I mean, I could talk for a, bil a billion and seven hours, but A, my voice won't go that long, and B, we all have like other things to do with our time. So I've broken it down to just a few things. So we've got some, I want to talk about the design of the website, the search product, front-end JavaScript, frameworks, and testing. So let's start with some design. Imagine it's 2010, you're Isaac Schluter, you've just created this cool thing called NPM, and you want people to know about it. Well, what do you do? You create a landing page, right? You just kind of, a nice, simple landing page where you're like, all right, I have a thing. Go to the GitHub repo, and then you can learn how to use it. And that's fine. Like, that's all you need to do. If the, the original problem is, I just need people to know about this thing, you put it online, and there you go. People can find it. This is searchable by the Googles. But then we started realizing that people were starting to create packages, and they started asking, well, wait a second, I'm, I've built this package, I've, I've published it, how do I know if anybody's even installing it? How do I know if anybody's even using it? Or, more interestingly, how do I find a good package? How do I even know what packages exist out there? So two years later, it took about two years for us to get to this point, uh, but the first version of the, of the NPM website was born. And this is just a, a, a nice website where you can kind of see, OK, hey, there are other users. And this is how many downloads there have been. And this is what's popular and all that good stuff. And more importantly, there are package pages. You can see an individual package page. And you can say, OK, well, this is what it's called. This is who it's maintained by. This is the version number. Um, where's the readme on here? It's, it's, it's actually on here, it's just below the fold. And one thing that we noticed is that people were hitting the, the NPM website, they'd find a package, and then they'd, they'd immediately leave. Where were they going? They were going to GitHub. 
Because the first thing that they saw was, oh, here's the repository link. Okay, well, if I, I guess if I want to go find the, if I want to know how to use this thing, I should just go ahead and go to the repository link. And we were like, well, that doesn't really work for us, right? I mean, the whole goal of a website is to get users to stay on your website forever and ever. At least that's what my marketers tell me. Um, so we were like, okay, well, what do we need to do now? Well, we need to redesign this site. Obviously, the UX just isn't quite the way that it needs to be. So we completely redesigned the package page. And now the README is front and center. And we started noticing that users were staying on the, on the website a lot more. And in fact, they were just going all around to the website because now they could see how beautiful these different packages pages were and they could say, oh, okay, well now I know, is this the right web framework for me? Okay, how do I use it? Oh, this seems a little bit complicated. Let me go to a different one. Oh, this looks like it's right for me. And, and then they could go ahead and start building stuff. Um, so we, we started doing this and then, and then you might have noticed we actually added a little bit of fun into this new design as well. We added a little wombat. And a lot of people are like, like, what is up with the wombat? What? I mean, actually, a lot of people think it's a bear. It's not a bear, it's a wombat. Wombats are, are little marsupials native to, to Australia. They're really cute, they're really adorable, and we like to have fun. Okay, but people wonder, why a wombat? Well, it turns out that if you take NPM, the logo, and you flip it upside down, it suddenly says WDU. And what does WDU stand for? Well, take an intern, who was really bored on a summer, uh, over the summer, and uh, maybe a little bit too much sugar in the office, uh, and some random twittering. And uh, obviously, it means the Wombat Developer Union. <clears throat> right? Isn't it obvious? Ask me about it later, I'll tell you the whole story. Um, but yeah, so we have the Wombat Developer Union. It adds a, a nice bit of whimsy to the whole, uh, the whole ecosystem. And uh, if, if I ever, refer to my colleagues as wombats, now you know why, it's just we're all wombats at NPM. So, okay, so back to this design. We have this new design, we actually also redesigned our homepage. Their entire site is in this nice, beautiful new design. And it's really, really useful and really great. But then we noticed another thing. Our users weren't signing up for products the way that we were expecting. In addition to all of these changes to the website, we also added products, right, because we need to add user value so that you will pay money so that I can get paid and I can pay my rent, which is way too expensive in San Francisco. Um, and, but, but really, so that the registry never goes over, it falls over ever again, and it hasn't. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Um, but our users couldn't find out where to learn information. They just didn't know that they could pay for things. I actually just learned the other day that there are users right now who don't even know that we have products. Did you know that we have products at NPM? There are three major products. This is not a sales thing, but there's NPM Enterprise, which is NPM behind a firewall. There's uh, NPM Solo, which is private packages for individual users. And then there's NPM Orgs, which is private packages and team management for organizations. It's like the GitHub model, but NPM flavored. Okay, cool. Uh, so what did we have to do? Well, we went ahead and built marketing pages. And these pages, it was like night and day. As soon as we launched this, like our user numbers, that was one of those peaks, right? It was just like, boom, oh, wow, I can actually go to your website and learn about the products that you sell, and then I can go ahead and buy them. And people started buying them because it turns out they actually wanted them and needed them. Imagine that. Marketing is actually quite useful and necessary. So, so that's, that's basically where we're at right now in, our, in terms of our design. We're constantly learning. There's way more stuff for us to keep discovering and playing with, and uh, there is so much more to be coming down the pipe, so come hang out on the NPM website. You'll find some cool stuff. Okay, let's talk about search. The big question about search is always, how do I find a package, right? Like, that's the whole point of search. It's like, how do I know what packages exist out there, and how do I know which, if it's the right one for me? And so, at least in the very early days, when there's only hundreds of packages, you don't have to do too much. This is the very first version of NPM Search. It's, uh, it's actually a Couch app, uh, meaning it's, it's backed by CouchDB, and it was written by one of our community members, who's just like, you know what? You need a search. I'll, do, I'll use it in CouchDB. This was like 2010, 2011, and that was fine. Uh, it worked 
for a f the first few hundred packages. And then once we got past the first few hundred packages, it fell over, and people weren't able to use it anymore. So that didn't work. Then we said, you know what, forget it. We'll just use Google. It's totally fine. So for a period of time, if you went into the, the search box, it would just take you straight to Google. And that works. I'm sure, how many of you actually still use Google to find NPM packages because search was so bad? Yeah, OK. It's not that bad anymore, but we'll get there. OK. And this worked great, right? And it works for tens of thousands of packages. It works as much as you like. But Google means that you have to leave the NPM website, which we already established is not the ideal perform uh, behavior of our users. And then also, we can't tell Google how to algorithm, right? Like, it's just not something that we can do. Google is this, and NPM, at least at this time, was Isaac. <laughs> so, so we, basically, the community once again came to the rescue, and someone created an Elasticsearch instance and said, hey, look, I've created an Elasticsearch instance. Put this up into a server. Uh, here's a, a skeleton algorithm that will work fine enough. And, and it did. It, it did fine. Um, it did fine for four years because nobody had any time to actually update the skeleton algorithm. And, um, and we heard about that a lot from our users. Probably the number one issue we ever got on our website uh, in terms of the issue tracker was, hey, did you know your search is terrible? And we're like, yeah, we know. And he's like, no, 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 really, your search is terrible. And, yeah, we know. No, your search. I'm just going to start using something else. And a lot of people just really did start using something else. Some people used Google, but then people started using other searches because the community, once again, came in and said, you know what, this isn't working for me. I'm going to build my own search. And so you have npmmodules.org or something, and then uh, all sorts of different search options. Until last year, a new one came on the scene called npms.io. And this was, again, one, uh, created by community members who were like, y'all, this is just, ooh. You know, we, we know search. We know how to do search, and we're going to do search really well. And we heard from the community. The community was like, wow, this is fast, and it's accurate, and I feel confident in its results. And I know that when I search npms.io that I'm going to get the module I need. And we said, OK, you know what? That is the, the biggest, most amazing recommendation we've heard. And we, we actually went ahead, and we reached out to them. And we said, hey, do you have an API? And they said, uh, yeah. Yeah, we do. So we have a new search. It uses npms.io. You don't have to worry about us ever having to maintain it, because they'll maintain it for us. Uh, <laughs> and it's totally open source. So you can go in and you can say, hey, you know what? Have you considered doing this instead? And they'll take care of it for you. Um, I'm, I'm really happy about this. I think this is a really great search option. And of course, there are still more things that we can do with search, right? People want filtering, and they want prioritization, and all sorts of other things. So we'll get there, slowly, slowly. Let's talk about front-end JavaScript. My very first task at NPM, FYI, I was the first employee at NPM. So NPM became a company. I started the first week of February. I'm about to hit my three-year anniversary. And I came on as a web engineer. And they were like, all right. We have no JavaScript on our website at all, but we need you to add stars. You know, we, need, we need people to start being able to click the star button, and it should star something. And I was like, I can do this. <laughs> and the thing about adding a star to a package page, it's pretty simple, right? It's like pretty straightforward. It's not simple if you've never done it before, but it's straightforward. There's, there's a very explicit set of pieces, steps to make this happen. But the question always is, how do I want to do this? I could use vanilla JavaScript. Absolutely, I could totally do that. But I don't know what's coming up next. Uh, I know it's going to be something big, but even the co-founders didn't know what was coming up next. So I had to just kind of say, well, OK, I don't know what's next, but I know it's going to be something. So probably vanilla JavaScript isn't the right way to go. But at the same time, I don't know what's next. So maybe using a massive front-end framework is not the way to go either. So I went with what most people do, and I just went with jQuery. <laughs> but the big question always is, OK, wait, how do you avoid jQuery soup? And for those of you not in the know, jQuery soup is 
like what happens when you have lots of people all trying to develop jQuery at the same time, and then there's like functions on top of functions, and there's no real order, and you just kind of feel like you're in a spaghetti forest of doom. Um, that's jQuery soup. Uh, we didn't want to have that. We wanted to avoid that as much as possible. Well, NPM's ethos is many small modules, and while that works really well on the back end, it also works really well on the front end. We went ahead and, and separated our, our JavaScript, our front end JavaScript, into lots of little modules, and we used Browserify to combine them all and, and turn them into one nice minified gzipped file, et cetera. And we used Gulp to automate that entire process. And that worked really well, except for the part where especially as we have a very tiny team, FYI, there are 20 people who work at NPM, 10 of whom are engineers. I want you to compare that to the millions of the users that are out there. Okay. And so the thing is that our tiny team means that none of us is an expert in anything. We're really a lot of generalists, which meant that while we have a couple of people who are really, really, really strong on the front end JavaScript because especially on the jQuery, because maybe they were on the jQuery team, we, not everybody is. And so people found some of the jQuery a bit daunting, and we realized, okay, well, we're going to be starting to build even more fancy schmancy stuff, lots of interactivity and a lot of really cool things, especially with our orgs product where you can, like, you know, we want to be able to drag and drop, and we want to create teams and add teams and, and add packages and all sorts of cool things. And doing that all with jQuery, while not impossible, can be really daunting to somebody who isn't really familiar with it. So then we made the decision, you know what, maybe we should start looking at front-end frameworks. So we looked at a few. And actually, we looked at as many as we possibly could, but we brought it down to a few. And we created a list of the things that we needed, right? We need a, a framework that is, that is flexible, that allows us to kind of learn as we go and figure it out as we go. We needed something that was scalable and that had proven itself in production already. We needed something that we could slowly work it into our website. We needed to, we didn't want to have to start an entire, we, didn't want, we couldn't rewrite the entire website. It wasn't something that our very tiny team with a very big mission could do. So we needed something that we could slowly work into our code base. And we needed something that was popular enough that if we needed, that, we, that when we were ready to hire, we could just hire somebody who was already an expert in that thing, or who already had experience in that thing, so that they didn't have to learn on the job. There's nothing wrong with learning on the job, but if I'm gonna hire somebody, I'd love for them to not have to learn at all uh, on the first go. Our tiny team, short timelines, etc. So out of all of these requirements, we brought it down to React. We said, okay, React is going to be the way we're going to go here. Now, I want to make a small caveat. There's nothing wrong with any of the other ones either. React was the right tool for us. Whatever tool you want for you is totally cool too. Just make sure you set what your requirements are and then say, okay, based on my requirements, this is the right tool for the job. Yeah? Okay, cool. We're not going to start any flame wars or anything like that. Okay. So we're working with React, and uh, we're playing around with it because we're not sure how we want it added into our web base or our code base just yet. And we run into Webpack, which Webpack is the most configurable thing ever. It has so many switches and so many dials, and you're just like, I have no idea how to get started. This is kind of overwhelming. And we said, you know what, we'll just put it to the side. Just, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And then finally we got to the point where we're like, okay, we need to get to this or else we're never going to implement anything in React. And fortunately, what comes on the scene just as we're like, all right, time to actually start doing something. There's a, 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 a really cool service called Next.js. And Next.js is a React-first framework. Uh, it was built by the team at Site. And uh, they've also done things like Now and, and other things. And what's nice about Next.js is that there, it's a very opinionated framework that says, we're going to take care of Webpack for you. We're going to take care of routing for you. You just play with the React stuff. You just have fun with React, and we'll take care of everything else. Because, and, and that's the great thing about frameworks, right? R frameworks are super opinionated, and that can be really good until you learn enough about the different opinions that you can say, OK, maybe this isn't the right opinion for me. So we had Next.js, and we said, all right, cool. We're ready to play with React. What should we build? Uh, normally, you find a tool to solve a problem, but we had a tool, 
And now we needed a problem. What did I just say about the number one biggest complaint ever from our community was? Search. Search. Thank you. I'm glad you're paying attention. There will be a quiz later. We used it to build search. We said, you know what? Our users have been complaining forever. We've just partnered with npms.io. We don't have to figure out Webpack right now. Let's just build this thing. So we created a new service, and we called it the search service. And it was amazing to see how quickly we could put everything together. It was unbelievable. It was super, super cool. So Next.js gave us a really fun and easy environment to start playing with React, and it got us the new search instance. Uh, whether or not we're going to continue with Next, now that we've learned a bit more about React, we have more opinions about how we think it should go and how, how we want to frame everything and, and set everything up. So I can't promise that we're going to be using Next.js forever, but at least for the first step, it was a really cool and, and really fun process. So there will be more front-end stuff. We'll get there. Keep watching. <laughs> Speaking of frameworks. I want you to go back again, back in time to 2010. And you're like, all right, I need to build a website. How am I going to do that? I'm sure you've never run into that situation before. I'm being extremely sarcastic. Every single one of us, every time we're about to start a new website, we're like, well, which one should I use now? Um, and it's 2010, and uh, it's, it's the beginning of the Node stuff. Express has just come out, and but it's, it hasn't garnered the, the community and the following that it had in the past. So what did Isaac do? He decided to create his own framework, right? A hand-rolled, artisanal, super special snowflake framework. And it was super cool. It was like, like <laughs> silly joke. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Never mind. OK. Uh, <laughs> I was going to make a hipster joke about pizza. Um, so. What did he do here? He basically created, like, do you see this, like, rec.model.end, and then there's, like, a callbacky thing? It's kind of promisey. Dude basically invented promises before there was a promises thing. That's cool. That's fun. Uh, there's actually nothing wrong with any of this. I think it's really cool when people are like, you know what, I'm going to build my own framework. Like, that's awesome. Um, where problems start to show up, though, is when I started, it took me six months before I was able to really, truly contribute to this code base. Six months is too long, uh, especially when you're a startup and you have a limited amount of time to start adding value for users or else the registry goes down. There's too much pressure. You don't have time to just say, oh my god, how does this work? What is promises before promises? I don't understand. Um, so. We, it, it was really difficult for us to spread the workload and get more people up and running really quickly, because in a startup environment, that's what you need. So we decided to just scrap the entire website and start from scratch with a framework that hopefully everybody's at least heard of. And we brought it down to these two decisions, we, or to a decision between these two frameworks. It was either Happy or Express. And um, how many of you have heard of Happy? Okay, so a few people. We'll talk about that. So we, we said, okay, you know what? Time to rewrite this thing. We're going to pick a new framework. It's going to be great. We had a special set of requirements that we needed. We needed something that was modular so that we could separate things out and have a nice modular code base. We wanted uh, something that was really easy to set up and get started. We wanted something that was reliable and secure and stable uh, and scalable, even more important. And then we also needed, we needed, at the time, it was literally just me. I was the only person on the web team. So I said, I need somebody that I can ask questions of, and I need them to respond as quick as possible. So between these two, we actually ended up going with Happy. And now let me tell you why. Happy has plugins, which, hey, instant modularity. And it was really quick and easy for us to set up. It was, I just, I managed to get a, a very, basic version of the website up and running in probably a few hours, which was really, really nice. And in terms of response times from the Happy team, they were instantly talking to us. Every single time I had a question, they responded within an hour at most. And that was just really, really lovely. But in terms of the reliability, the security, the scalability, Happy could not be beat. And here's why. Happy is created by the Walmart Labs team. 
don't know if you've ever heard of Walmart, but Walmart is one of the biggest retailers, if not the biggest retailer, of consumer goods in the United States. And in the U.S., we have a holiday called Thanksgiving. It's a you know, fun holiday, and it's the last major holiday before Christmas. Thanksgiving is on a Thursday, and most employees in, in the United States get both Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving off. There's nothing happening on Friday, but Thanksgiving's on a Thursday, so they go ahead and give you know, Friday off. Retailers have realized that this is a free day of shopping after the last major holiday before Christmas, when nobody's working, hey, wait a second, what if we make massive discounts and get everybody to shop on this one day when everybody's off on holiday? And thus, Black Friday was born. Have you, uh, surely you've seen the absolute ridiculous videos of people trampling over each other, trying to get into the store ridiculously fast and, and trying to get the really cool sales. You've seen these videos, and you're like, are Americans really that ridiculous? Yes. <clears throat> So Walmart Labs, on a Black Friday, they had a, a huge event called Node Black Friday. And what they did was they had Happy running on the mobile version of the website. And now, I want you to think about this. The entire country is off on vacation for a single day. It's the biggest consumer day of the year with massive discounts, and it's the biggest consumer retailer in the country. They didn't go down once. There were no bugs. There was maybe one bug that they fixed in production and nobody noticed on that day. Nothing went down. There were no security holes. It was fine. And so I was like, well, if, it's, if it works for Walmart, it's probably going to work for us. So that's what we did. We went with Happy. Um, and honestly, looking back, and you probably noticed this amongst yourselves, a very small number of people have ever heard of Happy. And uh, in terms of one of our requirements of you know, we want to make it so that people who join NPM can get up and running really quickly by having already experience with a certain framework. It hasn't really worked out in our favor on that front. So whether we stick with Happy or not, as we kind of move forward and grow our company, it's a little bit to be, it's still up in the air. We're probably not going to. We're probably going to be moving into a service-oriented architecture, actually. But that was a good lesson to learn. Finally, let's talk about testing. So when I think about testing, I think about the inevitable moment when you have to push code to production, right? It's always a little bit nerve-wracking because you're like, oh my goodness, is this going to work? And that's the whole point of tests, right? Your tests check to make sure that your code is of a good enough quality and that it does exactly what you expect it to so that when it goes up into, pr into production, you are confident that it's going to work. So testing is super important. Unfortunately, the very first website had no tests. I mean, none. Like, there, were, there wasn't even like a test.js or anything. Like, I, I was, it was amazing to me. So I said, OK, first thing I'm going to do is start adding tests to this new website. So we started out with Lab, which, like I said, we used Happy. So Lab is the uh, test runner for, it's a test framework within the Happy ecosystem. And we did it for, we used unit tests. Right? So we wrote, we wrote a bunch of unit tests in lab, and it seemed to work pretty well, and we felt pretty confident in our code. And then there would be a moment where we'd push to production, and even though all of our unit tests passed, there would be moments when interactivity between modules didn't work. Things started falling apart. And we realized it's because we had no integration tests. So we chose Selenium to start adding some integration tests, and that seemed to be a pretty good idea. Uh, for those of you who have experience with Selenium, you may have also noticed that using Selenium with Node can be a little daunting. Thankfully, the people at the team at PayPal have done an amazing job with Nemo.js, which is a, a Node-friendly wrapper around Selenium, and it's beautiful. You can just kind of say, OK, click on this thing, and then uh, make sure you enter these this data in these fields on this form, and then uh, make sure that this message is showing and all of that good stuff. And it was really easy to implement and all that good, and, and, and it was great. <clears throat> but then we also noticed that it's basically an automated monkey just clicking around, right? And that's great, but it took a long time. Whereas our unit tests take less than two minutes to run, our Selenium tests, our integration tests, could take up to 40 minutes, which is really long time, goodness gracious. And we realized it's because we were testing code paths that 
could, especially with the front end tests, they were all front end code paths that we could be just using unit tests and didn't have to go 100% through those code paths the way that we were. So we decided to add unit tests to the front end. I know you're probably thinking, like, why didn't you do that before? I don't know why we didn't do it before. We're too busy. I don't know. OK. Anyway, but we did. We finally did. We added Karma as a test runner for unit testing, or for the front end unit testing as well. Karma has a nice headless browser environment. And you can choose different browsers, and it's pretty great. So with all of this, we had we had all of our tests are covered. We're, we're doing pretty well. And then we realized, wait a second, all of the Karma tests and um, the, so Karma was testing and the integration testing, we were actually using TAP, uh, Node TAP, as our test framework. But then we were using Lab on our unit tests on our website. And we realized this is too much cognitive load of having to switch between the two. So we're actually going to be moving all of our tests slowly into Node Tap so that we can just say, OK, I know exactly how to write a test in Tap. Just make it nice and easy. So that's basically testing. So what's next? What, what are our goals moving forward? In the past three years, we've learned a ton of lessons. Right? We've grown our team, and we've learned what works and what doesn't work, and we've tried a lot of different things. And unfortunately, as a result, because we've changed our minds a few times and we can't always rewrite the website every single time we change our minds, we actually have little fragments of bits of code just kind of sitting around. There's actually, I didn't talk about our, our HTML and CSS situation, but we have, we have multiple, you can actually do an entire code path and you hit, uh, you hit style sheets that are written in stylus, in CSS, and in SAS all at the same time. Uh, and you're like, what? How does this work? And it's because when you're transitioning your code base, you can't just start over. You can't stop everything, rewrite it all, and then keep going. The, there's no time for that. Instead, you need, to, uh, you need to slowly transition your code base. And if you change your mind in the process of transitioning, then suddenly you have three transition points. And you're like, wait a second. This is ridiculous. So the first thing we're going to be doing is cleaning up. We're going to clean up our code base. We're actually going to be changing everything. We're, we're, we're starting from scratch, right? We're thinking about the, the service-oriented ar architecture. We're going to be doing everything in React. It's going to be really beautiful, but it's going to take some time because we need to slowly change things while we're also creating more value for our users. So it's going to be a slow process, but I'm confident that we can do this. That said, we're also going to be growing our team. Uh, we're going to be adding more people to the services team, and that's going to be really fun and really exciting. But at the same time, we've learned in the past that when someone comes into a new code base, it takes them a while to learn what the heck is going on. When you look at a code base, it's a lot like an archaeological dig site. right? You can see all the things that changed, but you have no idea why. Like, There's no information about, well, why did you choose this? And the only way to do that is to actually, you know, verbally, between two humans, talk things through and say, here's why we made this decision. I mean, obviously, you can add more comments and you can add more documentation, but our team has found that pairing is the best thing that you can possibly do. So we'll be doing even more of that. Um, and then, of course, the last thing that we're going to be doing, which is the thing that we're always doing, is adapt. Because if there's one constant in startup life, it's that change is inevitable. You will always be changing. You will always be doing different things. And honestly, because of our, the, the work that we do, and given that this is a website, and y'all build websites, and we want you to use our, our services and products to build your websites, then maybe we should also use our own products and services to build our own website. And so we're learning from you what the things to do are. And we're trying things out. I mean, I, I believe the technical term for this is dog fooding, uh, which is just a kind of gross idea. But anyway, so we're doing that. We're adapting and, and we're, we're learning what you do because we want to know what technologies you're using and what problems you're coming into so that we can create a better tool that, again, doesn't get in your way as you're building really great and awesome things. So as a thank you to all of, our, all of you, all of our users, um, we have created a special Austrian wombat. <laughs> uh, you may recognize Kaiser Franz Josef. Uh, <laughs> Schiläufer, you know, just, just having a good time. Um, that'll be me tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, 
truly. Thank you, all of you. I have these in stickers to come talk to me. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes, and we thank you so much for carrying through while we made them. Um, hopefully, we continue to make the product better. And if we're not, let us know. Like, talk to us. We are really friendly wombats, just hairless. Um, <laughs> come talk to me. Let's hang out. Let's chat. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>